Hi. Um, welcome to a session on scheduling. I'm Gary Cotton from VMware. I've been working in uh, OpenStack for just over three years now. Um, prior to joining uh, VMware, I was working at Red Hat. I'm a core reviewer in the, Nova pro in the Neutron project. <laughs> and in Nova, kind of, I've been contributing for nearly a year and a half now. And this is Gilad. I'm Gilad Slotkin. I'm working for Radvor. I'm working in OpenStack, I think, uh, maybe two years, maybe two years and a half. Uh, in the right where we mainly uh, focus on network services, on Neutron, on Elbus, uh, and actually our uh, Elbus solution uh, brought us uh, uh, to explore uh, scheduling requirements, and uh, that's how I became involved also in uh, Nova Scheduler. And uh, I think we are working together on that. That's the second year? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So actually some of the slides, if uh, any of you attended our session uh, in Hong Kong, in the Havana uh, Summit, you, you may recognize two or maybe three of the slides. So uh, there are new stuff. Uh, beside that, we are basically continue uh, the work that we did uh, for uh, Havana. And uh, we will share with you what was already done and uh, what uh, we are planning uh, for the roadmap going forward. Okay, so scheduling, it's all about, uh, or the, the, the scheduling that we are talking about is all about going away from best effort. Uh, and uh, best effort, it's not something that mission critical and performance critical application can live with uh, when deployed in, uh, in cloud. So more uh, we are analyzing mission critical and performance critical application requirements like uh, uh, ser availability, service level, performance service level, and security. Uh, more we see requirement for uh, Nova schedulers, for a, a Neutron scheduler, for storage scheduler, and uh, you will see how uh, those things uh, tie together. And when uh, we talk about mission critical application, uh, we are mainly trying to focus our customer uh, uh, attempt to migrate existing mission critical application to the cloud. You know, some uh, of our customers are building application from scratch, very much tailored to run on cloud. Uh, 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 but we also uh, see customers that are looking to deploy existing application built uh, with uh, multi-tier, uh, with a legacy uh, fault tolerance model, and they would like to migrate those applications to the cloud without changing them. Uh, and this also applies uh, to scheduling uh, policies that we need uh, to imply in order to help those customers uh, migrate the uh, application without changing them. Okay, so we are talking about availability. Availability, actually there are various uh, uh, definition of what availability service level means. Uh, we like to see two different levels, two different layers. The first one is fault tolerance. It means the application continues to be available uh, after the first fault. Some application may be built uh, to uh, sustain uh, even a second fault. High availability uh, sometimes means that application uh, uh, recover from a fault, but it's being uh, uh, unavailable for a very short uh, period of time. Typically, high availability means that there is uh, restarting the application from a persistent uh, state. Uh, and disaster recover means the application restarting on a different site, uh, typically from a persistent uh, replicated uh, uh, state. When uh, availability uh, is addressed from a cloud point of view, Usually, uh, uh, availability zone, it's, it's, the, it's the main uh, tool. And availability zone is something that uh, allows you to deal uh, actually with, with all uh, level of availabilities. But 
availability zone traditionally is something that is more uh, uh, related to disaster recovery, actually, okay? And you can see many applications actually using uh, availability zone also uh, to address fault tolerance. Uh, we will see that sometimes availability zone is not sufficient. You will need uh, to have a more sophisticated scheduling policy to ensure fault to uh, tolerance. Performance, when we talk about performance, usually there are two uh, main metrics. It's uh, latency, transaction latency, uh, and transaction uh, throughput. Uh, transaction latency has to do with networking connectivity. It also has to do with, uh, with compute capability to, uh, and, and also uh, bandwidth uh, has to do with both uh, network capacity and compute uh, capability, and uh, we will see how it relates to uh, scheduling. Uh, the last one, security. Uh, there are several aspects of security. Most of them can be addressed by uh, scheduling. It's data privacy, data integrity, and denial of service, that it's, uh, it's also a combination of uh, a network uh, connectivity, and a, a network service to protect application from denial of service. But those are the service level that uh, we are looking uh, when deploying mission critical and performance critical applications. Uh, so, next. So you may be wondering what, what uh, all this has to do with the Nova scheduler, with the network scheduler, with the storage scheduler. So let's start to explore uh, how it relates to scheduling. So, for example, availability uh, means that you may want to have uh, anti-affinity. If you deploy, for example, two instances of database, so you have a fault tolerance, you don't want to schedule those two VMs or to, to uh, be placed on the same host, because if you're losing this host, you, you lose uh, both copies of the data, so you don't really gain any... Uh, fault uh, tolerance. So it mainly uh, relates to anti-affinity, and we will explore anti-affinity. Actually, anti-affinity was already implemented as part of ISALS. Uh, we will uh, talk about that. Uh, next is performance. Performance, it's mainly about network proximity. Uh, you may want uh, uh, to place VMs uh, that depend on a, on a network uh, capacity uh, closer to the network, on hosts that are closer to the network. For example, on the, U, the Cisco UCS uh, uh, system, there are hosts that are better connected to the network specifically for, uh, to deploy uh, network services than other hosts that are deeper in, uh, uh, in the network tree. So you want to take those network proximity consideration when you deploy applications that are sensitive to network uh, uh, capacity and, uh, and latency. Uh, another aspect is host capability. In, uh, in some uh, customers, the cloud environment is not heterogeneous. You may have different types of servers. Uh, uh, newer servers may be uh, are better capable than older servers, and you may need to take those uh, capability into consideration when you're deploying uh, VMs. For example, uh, uh, if you have a multi-tier uh, application, you may want to put a database on a server that has uh, a more uh, a memory capacity, faster memory, uh, stronger uh, CPU. Uh, currently, the, the Nova scheduler, at least until uh, Havana, each server could be chosen, you know, the, on a best effort uh, uh, level. Uh, the same uh, goes for storage proximity, and we will show some examples. And the database it may be a good example. So, uh, you may want to place uh, the database instance on a host that has a closer a connectivity to your uh, SAN or to your uh, shared storage. Uh, and uh, we will show examples to that as well. <coughs> Regarding security, uh, it's all about isolation, resource isolation, and exclusivity. And exclusivity can be either on the compute side or on the network side. 
and uh, we will show examples to that. So as you can see, availability, performance, and security very well applies different strategies or different policies uh, for scheduling. Next. Let's, uh, let's use this as, as an example. Uh, this is kind of a typical uh, three-tier or two-tier or multi-tier uh, application. You have a, a load balancer, a two instances of load balancer for high availability or for fault tolerance. You have uh, several instances of uh, 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 web server, uh, VMs, and you have uh, two database instances. Uh, and when you are uh, uh, deploying uh, this seven, seven VM subsystems, uh, you need to take uh, those interrelationship uh, between the components into consideration. And what we suggested, I think it was back in uh, Grizzly, uh, that you cannot just schedule each one of those VMs independently and hope for the best, okay? And then we will show uh, the example. If you do, next slide. Uh, so, uh, for example, you have, we have three hosts. Uh, the empty boxes means available uh, capacity, okay? And you would just run a Nova scheduler on, uh, on those seven VMs independently. You will end up uh, for the next, uh, uh, you will end up scheduling this. So if you just start, the two load balancer uh, will be uh, maybe uh, scheduled on host one. It means that every host, every single failure, guarantee to fail your entire application, okay? that that would mean a best effort a scheduling of, of this application. Uh, otherwise, you know, we, we alternative uh, scheduling will need to take anti-affinity into consideration, and that's what you would expect an anti-affinity scheduling uh, uh, to result with, okay? So every single host failure uh, the application is still resilient to any failure, okay? As you can see, any failure here, uh, the application continue uh, to work, and that's exactly fault tolerance that needs to be achieved uh, when you are uh, migrating uh, such an application uh, to the cloud. So this is the motivation behind the anti-affinity that we have already uh, implemented in, in ISAF, okay? Uh, next slide. This is your slide. Yeah. So basically, as Gilad mentioned, towards the end of the Grizzly cycle, we came up with the notion of doing uh, group scheduling. So the idea was to be able to deploy at one shot a multi-tier application and to be able to have a highly available, um, high performance, and very resilient uh, running application in the cloud. Um, sadly, none of that really kind of uh, was accepted by the community, and we've had to do it very much in a piecemeal fashion. So up until now, fortunately, we we're enabled um, to get in the Icehouse uh, release the initial server groups uh, implemented. What does that mean? It means kind of with server groups, we're able to implement anti-affinity. So essentially, kind of as the application that Gilad kind of uh, previously mentioned, we're able to here create three server groups where we can have anti-affinity with load balancers, anti-affinity with the database instances, and anti-affinity with the, with the web servers. This basically enables us to have a highly available three-tier application that, that can run in the cloud. Um, throughout the Icehouse and um, Havana cycles, kind of this was work that was done jointly with uh, Debu Dutta with Yati Udupi from Cisco, with Mike uh, Spritzer and uh, myself. Um, can we go to the next slide? So essentially kind of what has been added in the Icehouse release. Basically there's a, a new table that's called server groups, where the user's able to create a server group and they're able to assign a policy to the server group. At the moment there are two supported policies. These are anti-affinity and affinity. Prior to the Icehouse release in Havana, a similar feature was supported, 
but the admin would have to go and edit the Nova scheduler configuration files and add the two extra filter um, schedulers into the configuration file. Now the affinity and the anti-affinity filters are already kind of default filters. So out of the box, the anti-affinity and the affinity scheduling um, already works. In addition to this, uh, an additional feature that's very useful is it's backward compatible. So if somebody was using it with their Havana release, then the same support will be continued. So how does one go about booting a anti-affinity um, setup? Basically, one makes use of a scheduler hint where the keyword is uh, group, and the user can pass through either the name of the instance group that was created previously or the UUID. How it all works is basically the scheduler knows on which host in host's instances are deployed, and then according to the scheduling policy, the scheduler will in turn decide which hosts are available for selection. And those hosts will use the additional um, filters of the scheduler to decide on which host to deploy that, whether it be the host with the amount of free resources or the one with the most available capabilities. Um, and thanks to Russell Bryan from Red Hat and uh, Xing Yuan Huang from uh, Cisco, we're able to get this implementation done in IceHouse. So basically, up until now, we've explained kind of what exactly exists in the Nova scheduler. And basically, in order to provide uh, availability, performance, and security, we'd like to show different ways of scheduling that can provide um, enterprise-grade uh, scheduling. So basically, we're going to show through a number of use cases and examples how one can make use of hierarchical scheduling, cross-scheduling, and rescheduling to have a highly available kind of high performance and a very secure setup and environment to run in the cloud. So the first example I'd like to discuss is uh, doing storage and computes cross-scheduling. Cross um, an example I'll use for this is the VMware storage policy-based uh, management. What does this mean? It means that there are two levels of uh, scheduling that will take place. The, the first is to select kind of the data store where the virtual disk for that running instance will be stored. And this will be done kind of in the code that we've got upstream in proposal at the moment via flavor metadata. Essentially, kind of uh, storage policies could be defined on via the, the SPBM uh, APIs, where one can, for example, have a number of data stores. Say, for example, a super fast data store, which that one could uh, have a gold tag, and a very slow, old, say, legacy data store, which could be bronze. So when somebody wants to deploy a VM, they can say this VM can be deployed um, with a specific flavor on a gold uh, data store. In addition to the data store selection, the specific host that the instance will be running on will have to be selected to. Um, this basically requires that all of the hosts be connected to the aforementioned uh, data stores. So, can, so over here, basically, there are two levels of uh, scheduling. The first is for the data store, and the second is for the host to run the instance. And here we can basically see a diagram of basically the two um, parts that take place. There's the, the VM uh, that's going to be running on a specific host and the virtual disk that's going to be placed on a specific data store. These will essentially go through the storage policy based um, filtering that's provided by the backend uh, VMware driver. And these, according to their profiles, will be placed on the specific data store. An additional advantage of the specific approach is that the data stores um, will be highly available and also mirrored. So essentially, that data will be replicated. So if one of the data stores, uh, if the host fails, then that uh, virtual disk will still be available. So this provides kind of in addition to um, professional, pr pr in addition to um, being able to have preferential service regarding the, the placement and the performance of the disk, there'll also be high availability in the event of a host failure. Another example kind of closer to home is uh, performance. So here we're going to show that if somebody uses uh, cross-scheduling um, with uh, storage and compute resources, we're able to impl uh, implement uh, improved performance. What does that mean is basically if somebody's attaching an additional volume to the instance, we'd like that instance volume to be as close to the instance as possible. So basically performance for that uh, instance will be a lot better than if the um, volume is, is on a data store that's pretty far away. 
In addition to this, kind of one of the things that we've seen is that if the actual glance image is also stored kind of closer to where the running instance will be, the, the boot time of that instance will be a lot quicker. So for example, in the VMware case, um, if we're able to store the, um, the glance image on a, on a VMware data store, instead of copying that glance image from glance to Nova, we're able to do a direct copy on the data store. So that will mean that's improved uh, boot time for instances. In addition to this, we'd like to show kind of how rescheduling can also provide kind of high availability and additional features. Say, for example, there are applications that are running on a number of hosts and one of these hosts fails. Basically, what we'd like to do is be able to uh, ensure that those uh, running instances can be run on hosts that are up and running. So that can ensure kind of that the application is highly available in the cloud. Another example, another two examples, first of all is the distributed resource, resource scheduling. Say for example, a host is, uh, becomes very, um, there the, are the too many VMs that are running on the host. One's able to make use of uh, vMotion to move kind of VMs which say have a lower priority to additional hosts. So basically the applications that are mission critical, they can receive more um, scheduling and compute, sorry, more compute power and those that are kind of disturbing the, 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 the high performance applications could be moved to um, hosts that aren't, uh, aren't pretty loaded at, at the moment. Another option is to make use of to do um, instance evacuation from a specific host. Uh, there are a number of use cases for this. One is that, for example, you'd like the, the host to be shut down. That's for power maintenance. Another one is you'd like to upgrade uh, the software running on, on, the, on the host. For example, let's take a case where we've got a, a KVM compute node and we'd like to upgrade the, 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 the hypervisor for libvirt. So basically we're able to make use of live migration to move those running instances to, to another host, able to upgrade the, the software and then uh, redeploy the instances back to, to the specific host if necessary. Let me show you another example of rescheduling uh, that also uh, relates to availability and performance. So the first example, uh, this, is, this is actually the way uh, Radware uh, deploy uh, load balancing as a service. Uh, we deploy a, a, a pair of load balancers per tenant uh, running in a specialized uh, a project and those pairs are uh, connected uh, so they can actually share a state. So if one of the uh, load balancer is down, then uh, the service, the load balancing service is tolerant, is tolerant to this uh, failure. However, uh, the service now lost his uh, spare wheel. The service is running, but the service is not fault tolerant anymore, okay? So what we do, we orchestrate uh, what we call a, a fault recovery uh, rescheduling. So we basically create a, a second instance, a, a failover uh, a instance, and we wire uh, this to uh, the surviving instance such that the load balancing service become a fault uh, tolerant again. Okay, so this is an example for rescheduling for, uh, uh, for availability. The second example, actually it's a rescheduling for performance. Uh, assuming uh, the application was deployed with uh, some uh, load balancing capacity, uh, but this application become very popular and this capacity is insufficient. So there is a need to scale up the load balancing capacity and you want to do that while the application con uh, continues to run. So what we do uh, in this case, we actually doing a, a controlled failover. So uh, we create a, a larger uh, load balancing instance. We connect this larger uh, instance as a failover. We Control, we do a, a controlled failover to this instance. We upgrade the first one. 
So after uh, uh, this uh, complicated uh, rescheduling and scheduling, we start with two small instances and we end up with two large instances to increase the load balancing uh, uh, capacity. And we are doing that uh, while the application continue to run uninterruptedly. Uh, so rescheduling those instances may actually end up on a total different host especially if we are uh, deploying a larger instance, maybe there is no uh, capacity on the original uh, host, uh, and we still need to make sure anti-affinity, okay, between all those instances uh, throughout the, the process. So this is an, another example of uh, rescheduling. Um, an additional example of scheduling is hierarchical ske scheduling. Um, basically, what we'd like to show here is basically how to use host exclusivity to have a sec secure tenant isolation. At the moment, through Neutron, one's able to have network isolation. What does that mean? So that each tenant can run their traffic on their own networks. But what happens if you've got a host that can be compromised? Basically, that's one VM that's running on the host can, through a backdoor, access another VM. So here, additional level of security is to basically have host isolation. Say, for example, tenant one can only run its instances on a specific host. And tenant two and tenant three, those, kind of, those can share their hosts. So essentially, tenant one has got compute security. In addition to the network isolation, it's also got host isolation. So it enables it to have a more robust and secure environment which the VMs can, can run. So basically, just to sum everything up of what we have and where we're going, hopefully, in the future. So currently, by Icehouse, we've got the server group implementation. At the moment, there is uh, anti-affinity support and affinity support. In addition to this, as mentioned previously, there's the backward compatibility with a, a Havana installation. So what does the future hold? Basically, I'm going to go over a few things that uh, are kind of being discussed at the moment, and hopefully at the summit we'll be able to discuss and uh, bash out, and in the coming versions we'll be able to provide this kind of support in, in the scheduler. Um, first and foremost, in the server groups, there are a number of new filters that we'd like to add. Um, one of those is network proximity. Say, for example, a host is connected to a specific NIC, which is super fast, and another host is connected to a NIC, which isn't that fast but those two NICs are connected to the same virtual network. So basically, if the scheduler knew kind of of those capabilities and the response times and the number of hops between all of the instances, it would be able to select kind of the host which would provide a network proximity regarding various characteristics of the network. In addition to this, we'd like to be able to add uh, rack affinity and anti-affinity. Similar to host affinity, we'd like to have rack affinity that certain instances could run in the same rack for improved performance, maybe security, etc. And as Gilad mentioned at the very beginning, is we'd, we'd like to be able to take advantage of host, cap host capabilities. Say, for example, kind of regularly vendors, kind of hardware vendors, they come out with their new and improved uh, servers. So how are we going to be able to leverage the fact that we've got a new kind of uh, supercomputer that's been added to our, to our range of hosts, and we've got the old legacy ones? So how can we enable the scheduler to take advantage of that for special applications that we'd like to have them with high performance? And how can we use kind of, say, applications, for example, um, in Amazon, you can just uh, run uh, instances, spot instances. So how can we leverage uh, f uh, functionality like that? Um, another thing that's being discussed at the moment is something that Mike from IBM proposed, that's uh, simultaneous scheduling. Um, one of the discussions is whether that will be done at the layer of heat or within the Nova scheduler. Kind of, it's something to be able to have, uh, similarly to what we mentioned at the beginning of the talk, is to have one initial placement where the scheduler's got like a holistic view of the entire, um, all of the resources that are, that are available. Um, in addition to this, there's the host exclusivity. At the previous uh, summit, this was something that was proposed by Phil Day from uh, HP. Um, I know kind of that's still kind of in discussion regarding the, the proposal. Um, a few extra things that are kind of in flux and in discussion at the moment. Um, the first and most interesting is the Schedule as a Service project. This kind of the nickname is called Gantt. 
And basically the, the initial steps kind of with this will be driven by Silva and from Red Hat at the, at the summit is to essentially take a forklift from the existing Nova scheduler and hopefully we'll be able to discuss uh, APIs. Hopefully kind of moving forwards, this will be kind of a platform to enable cross scheduling between a number of projects. At the moment kind of each uh, project has their own scheduler and it's kind of mutually exclusive from all of the other projects. So say for example, the Nova scheduler can select on which host to, to run a, an instance. The Cinder scheduler could select a volume and that may completely kind of negate the policy that the, the end user would wish to achieve. Um, some backend drivers using their technologies are able to ensure that that kind of works super magically out of the box. But in the open source community, that's not really out there. Um, one of the pain points of the scheduler at the moment is performance is that if there are a large number of schedulers that are running and there's a, a considerable number of hosts in the setup, then the scheduler could be the bottleneck. And one of the features that has been uh, proposed by Boris from Marantis is to have a no DB scheduler. That's basically each scheduler will have an in-memory um, picture of the current situation and be able to improve performance times. Okay, so before we get uh, to the questions, let me just summarize. So basically we identify some mapping between service level and scheduling policies. Uh, this is not exhaustive uh, uh, table, but as you can see, availability maps to anti-affinity and rescheduling also required to really ensure availability. Uh, performance means proximity, network proximity, storage proximity, host capability, and uh, as we saw in some example, it may require some cross-scheduling and rescheduling. And security uh, implies resource uh, exclusivity and also hierarchical uh, uh, scheduling. But those are uh, uh, just few examples. Uh, and as uh, Gary mentioned, uh, scheduler become a bottleneck and actually more complicated is expected to be. Uh, the challenge of uh, its performance is, is going to grow. So I think the Mirantis uh, initiative uh, uh, to boost up scheduling by using uh, in-memory uh, uh, database is, is a good uh, move forward and it allows us to push uh, scheduling complexity even further. Any questions? Yeah. Would you mind to go to the microphone so everybody can hear you and you will be recorded? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so when you're talking about anti-infinity, you mentioned that um, you can place a, a VM on a given host. Now, in regards to VM where this is, if you did that, does the scheduler then know if DRS kicks in and moves a VM to a different host, that that VM exists in that host. I mean, how is it keeping track of the VMs? So anti-affinity, it's, it's an attribute uh, that you don't forget after uh, the initial scheduler. You continue to remember the anti-affinity relationship between different uh, uh, VMs, so you use it also when you reschedule. Okay, and that, that's the way it's currently yeah. implemented. C kind of regarding to, to, to your question, kind of the, the, the anti-affinity support here is more relevant to, say, the libvirt uh, driver. Okay. Whereas the, there's the one-to-one -one mapping between the, the, the hypervisor and, and, the, and the actual host. In, in the VMware case, say if one would be using um, the anti-affinity scheduling, it would basically pick another cluster. Yeah, kind of one of the things on our to-do list is to, to enforce kind of that anti-affinity filter to percolate through to the, the VMware driver and then ensure that there's anti-affinity with the, with the ESX hosts. Um, I've got one more question. Sure. Um, so this is related to the rescheduling. So you mentioned that if a VM fails, um, for the load bank, for example, let's say, the VM fails, the rescheduler sees it, it then kicks off another one, right? What happens if you start spinning up another one and that fails and then it, does it continuously do that or is there some sort of logic to say don't just shoot yourself in the foot and by spinning up like 100 VMs? Okay, typically a fault tolerance, you get to design your fault tolerance system to a given number of failures. Typically it's one, okay? Yeah. You can design the system to be tolerate uh, to more than one failure, okay? Uh, 
Of course, if the system was designed to uh, resist a single failure, and there is more than one failure, the system will fail, okay? Unless the system was pre-designed to sustain uh, more than one failure. But the design you were talking about here is yes. encompassed by just one. Yes, yes, and this, this is typically, when you say fault tolerant, it's a single, it's a single, it's tolerant for, to a single failure, okay? It, it may be resilient to multiple failure, but not at the same time, not simultaneous uh, failure. Okay. Yeah, more questions? Yeah. Um, you mentioned the possibility to schedule uh, uh, with rack affinity. My question is, uh, at the moment, uh, Nova is not uh, taking in account rack location. So, uh, in order to, to get this feature quite quickly, uh, do you plan any do you plan any cross project integration like triple O? Um, I, I haven't really thought about the the triple O yet, but the, the the current implementation of the rack affinity in in Nova at the moment that's using um, the selections done if they on the running on the same subnet. The, the idea here was to add to the to the server groups the, the, the ability to do rack affinity. And there'd have to be some kind of ID, whereas we'd know which hosts are in the same rack. Kind of that we've yet to think out and decide kind of what the best way of going about that is. Okay, my, my question was about the definition and the discovery of the of the location of the of the hosts within the racks. So uh, hence, I, hence, hence the proposal of triple O because- the, That's I, a good I, idea, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's kind uh, of best effort, first come, first come. I just wondering if anyone's uh, curious about profiling the VMs, so you can do more risky scheduling to know something uh, is pretty idle in the afternoon or more active in the evening, how much CPU network it uses, so you could kind of riskily place them on different hosts and get more out of your resources. Um, th th that's Just curious a very about interest in the community. I, I, I think that's a very, a very good idea. At the moment, kind of, that's something that's not really taken into account at the moment by the existing scheduler, but uh, it's certainly something that's worth discussing. But, uh, I think. I think. I think one example I'm aware of uh, in a VMware vCenter scheduler, you can set the priority. So you can have a VM priority one, two, three. Uh, maybe four, I think that's uh, the highest priority. And uh, the priority is taking into account when you do the V motion, you know, when you need to evacuate the server, or you, you want to do a, a load balance, workload balancing. So you tend to move the low priority VMs uh, also in the... Uh, no, the notion here is not about priority. Assume both your VMs have the same, but Maybe together they can't coexist because they're not, you know, they were both active equally at the same time. But knowing that one's active in the morning and one's active in the evening, they can coexist on the same physical resource and expand to its full capacity. So that's the idea that I want to explore here. Uh, I'm not aware of, uh, of uh, this type that's of good. attribute. We can yeah. innovate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a nice idea. Hi, so this one's about um, quantity of information and complexity. So, and it's an open question. So, you've got networking and you mentioned about having how many routers in between things and needing to know that so you can make decisions about networking usage. You've got uh, compute nodes and racks and being aware of that and then you've got PCI stats and stuff like that about each node and then you've got the affinity and the server groups you were talking about. We're starting to get service in the middle if we follow that path that knows all things about everything. That's how far do you think we should go down that path versus having something that's very coarse-grained abstractions? Or do you think there's another way to deal with the complexity? Uh, I think more application will be cloud-ready, will be designed to run on cloud and take a best effort scheduling into account in the design of the application, you will need less and less this fancy scheduling uh, 
attributes, okay? I think uh, the requirement for fancy scheduling, uh, it's a phenomena that's very much related to the problem of migrating existing application to the cloud, okay? Uh, if I'm just telling you, all you have is availability zone, okay? Design your application accordingly. Don't assume any fancy scheduling. You will probably be able to, to deal with performance, with availability, with everything, and see how many uh, uh, customer users are deploying mission critical application on Amazon with the best effort scheduling, what, unless you buy their uh, VPC server service, okay? When uh, you get to control uh, it uh, in a finer grain. But I think it's, uh, it's a, it's a two-way uh, movement, okay? Uh, on one end, uh, you can you can live with uh, uh, with best efforts uh, scheduling if you take this into account when you design that your application, okay? And uh, uh, the context of this is mainly around taking existing application, existing uh, fault tolerance uh, uh, methods, and map them uh, to the cloud without requiring to redesign your application. That, that makes scheduling more complex. I think in the future, we don't really need that level of complexity to answer your question. Okay. Okay. I think we are running out of time. The flashlight. Okay, thank you. Bye. <laughs>